want to take a, a moment to, to thank Brian Thompson to join us today. I've had the pleasure of, of working with Brian in the in the courses offered by North Texas in U.S. Soccer. Um, unbelievable guy. Uh, very, very easy to listen to. Unbelievably knowledgeable. You know, and a great guy to be around. But I think what he's going to offer today is something special, and, and I hope you guys enjoy it as much as I am. Because I'll tell you, just looking at the slides and the preparation of it, I think, you know, it's going to be something really meaningful and impactful. Uh, there'll be times when he opens up for questions, and, and please feel free to do so. You know, like I said, uh, it's, we're going to be a really, really good session. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Okay. Thank you very much, Warren. Um, uh, first off, thank you uh, to Warren and Fred for having me here. Some of you I can see on the call I know, others I don't. Um, and uh, I just want to thank you guys for the opportunity. Please bear with me. Um, Probably like a lot of you, I'm used to Zoom. This is on a little bit different platform, so we'll try to we'll try to muddle through it. I'm going to go ahead and um, kind of give the discussion. I'll show you some examples of some things, and then um, we can open it up and and we can we can talk. I didn't necessarily script this out or time this, or whether we get to an hour or it's 30 minutes or what have you. But as soon as I'm done, we're <clears throat> I'm more than welcome to answer any questions that I can. Um, so with that being said, <clears throat> um, what we're really talking about uh, today, and I'm going to go ahead and hopefully everybody can see this. Let me present this to everyone. Um, so really, uh, is everyone okay with seeing it? Warren, you can see that fine? Yes, we're good to go. All right. So um, really what we're talking about here is this idea of periodization. So before we get started, let me just say that, <clears throat> that um, you know, there's a lot of different things. You could Google periodization and you could go out there and you could see um, all kinds of, of different, different things. What I'm going to describe to you is simply one way. It's not the only way. Um, I'll mix in some things uh, from U.S. soccer, uh, ideas from U.S. soccer, um, and, and the Again, yeah, those are, it's one way of doing it. It's one way that U.S. soccer sees that. You might take um, a course somewhere else. You might take an NSCAA course. They might have different terminology, what have you. Um, so keep that in mind. The second thing to also keep in mind is that I'm going to try to give all of you some general ideas, some general ideas of, of periodization. your system. And, and in particular, tactical periodization and what, what that kind of means. Um, but it's general overview. And I know that uh, many of you, um, many of you uh, listen to Ian Barker and Vince Gansberg, who are fantastic guys. I know them both um, with NSCAA last week. And I know that upcoming you're going to have um, Gary Williamson and Janae Baklowski, who work, do a lot of work with the U.S. soccer. And I know both of them. And so um, if you're kind of interested in filling in your own ideas for this, I would strongly suggest that you take uh, one of those, one of their courses. I've, I've, I work with both. I've, I've delivered both and um, I think they're good. So all of that being said, um, let's kind of move forward. So this idea of periodization, um, when most of us, when most of us think about the idea of periodization, um, a lot of times we talk about physical periodization. And so um, I thought I would just pull a uh, kind of a definition, the most basic definition that I could find. Periodization is really just dividing something into periods. Um, for lack of a better word, it's kind of chunking it up, but you're chunking it up for your team, if that, if that makes sense to you. And so we could periodize anything uh, within the game of soccer. I mean, it's, uh, there are people who will go out um, and will, if you listen to someone like John Cohn, who does a lot of the physical preparation for the U.S. Soccer Federation, he'll talk about physical periodization and he'll talk about, um, you know, numbers and training sessions and, and physical loads and and rest periods, and that is that is perfectly fine. You can periodize things that way. Um, one of the newest kind of things that is coming out in soccer education world is this idea of a psychological periodization. 
So believe it or not, there are people out there who are looking at, you know, um, the cognitive, the social aspects, the psychological competitive aspects of soccer and saying, well, how can we periodize that? Can we, can we have training sessions, which are more intense, more competitive, require the players to be more focused. And we're going to consider that, you know, a hundred percent effort. And then we're going to kind of scale down over the period of weeks or months. Uh, how are we going to build that? How are we going to divide that? So that's another type of periodization that's out there. Um, what I'm going to suggest to all of you is this concept of tactical periodization. And so um, there's really some key ideas to this, uh, but, but the idea of tactical periodization has to do with um, first and foremost um, that we consider the tactics and when I say tactics, when we talk about players, reading and understanding the game, um, reading and understanding the game. And so how do we read and understand the game? Well, we read and understand the game at its most basic level is the ball, our teammates and the opponent. And so because in soccer, this is constantly, constantly changing. Um, we consider this in a lot of ways to be the most um, the most important thing. Uh, so if we looked at the key qualities, especially in U.S. soccer, if we look at the key qualities of players, the number one thing there is reading and understanding the game. And that's in relation to the ball, your teammates and the other team. That being that being said, um, when we go out to scout or we go out to look for players, for instance, for our youth national teams, the number one consideration is, is reading and understanding the game. If they can't read and understand the game, then it becomes impossible for them to actually problem solve on the field. And, um, and so if you, if you buy into that, if you consider that to be um, a priority, uh, I, can, I can tell you that I do, then this idea of tactical periodization will make will make a lot of sense to you. So when you look at number one uh, on my presentation, it really says that tactical periodization is the idea that we focus on the tactical concept or aspects of soccer. So our main our main goal or our main focus as we as we kind of design our team development, as we design our training sessions, as we design our season is really with a focus on tactics, tactical concepts, problem solving, getting our players to read and understand the game. Um, and and that that could be a webinar in and of itself of how do we do that. But I, at the end, I'm going to kind of provide you some examples and go through some ideas for that. Now, you'll notice that what I say or what I'm telling you is it's a focus on the tactical concept. So what a lot of people would then say is, well, we can't just focus on tactics because there's there's other elements to the game. And for those of you, I talked to Warren a little bit about, you know, kind of backgrounds of some of the people on the call. For those of you who've had um, a previous kind of coaching education background, depending on how long ago you you did that, uh, you did that course or how long ago you took that, um, you'll remember something we call the four pillars of the game. And just for some background for everybody, I actually took my B license in 1992. And before that, I was instructing um, what would now, I guess, consider, be considered grassroots courses in North Texas. 1990 or so. So I've seen a lot of the evolution of of these types of things. And I can tell you that there we don't really talk about it now, but there was this idea of the four pillars. And so what are the four pillars of the game? Well, they're technical, they're tactical, they're psycho, um, psychosocial, and then they're physical, right? So the focus here is tactical, but we don't necessarily um forget about or exclude or say that the other pillars or nowadays if you've taken a recent course the key qualities the six key qualities of a player um, are excluded from that that is not what we're saying 
And we're not saying that one is necessarily um, more important than another, um, but we are saying that our focus really here is, is the tactical, is the reading and understanding of the game, and then all of these other things are going to help us execute tactically, if that makes sense to everyone. So um, it, it can still be um, economical training. You can still have <clears throat> in your plan and in your sessions, you can still incorporate all these different elements of a player that you want to develop. But our emphasis and our planning really resolves around tactics and um, and the idea of problem solving for players. So that all being said, um, you know, some of this is going to kind of revolve around your own personal philosophy. And if none of the other coaching uh, education instructors that come on here talk to you about there have talking or have spoken to you about that, you may want to kind of <clears throat> look at your own philosophy before we get started. And you'll see why I'm saying this in just a minute. Um, for instance, your style of play, maybe the culture that you grew up in, um, your beliefs of how the game should be played. If most of you are like most of us, myself included, you you grew up playing the game and you tend to coach in a way that reflects how how you grew up, how your coaches coached you. Um, but it becomes pretty pretty important to really have a grasp of this as you move forward in tactical periodization, because you have to have a clear vision of how you want to play. Um, and so I would, I, I would suggest to all of you, and I'm guessing I have a lot of teachers on this call, um, that it's very similar to your classroom courses. If you don't have an overall understanding of how you want to teach the course, it becomes very difficult for those of you who at least kind of design or, or put together all your own lesson plans. It becomes very hard if you don't have an overview to then be able to kind of chunk things up and make them connect logically for your classes. So this is no different in in coaching. We, we're basically a classroom on the field. And so um, I would suggest that before you kind of go down the rabbit hole of tactical periodization that you give some thought to that. The last thing is, is um, this idea that even though we may, even though we may um, come up with a tactical periodization plan, we may divide all this up, we may have something going forward. We constantly need to be observing what we're doing, um, planning, uh, replanning, um, executing that plan, and then going back and evaluating what worked, what didn't, did it make sense to the players, were the players progressing. Um, the, the difference is, and this is where I think, you know, a lot of times with coaches, um, that happens to us, and I see this both in club coaches, high school coaches, um, this idea of um, constantly doing this. So we all get busy and we all have things that are going on and then we put this plan together and we run through it and then we, you know, we get somewhere down the road and we think, well, that didn't work. My suggestion to everyone uh, is that this is a constant process. And so you have to set aside specific periods in your tactical periodization um, to be able to, uh, to observe, to replan, to execute again, to go back and re-execute a training session, evaluate where it works. And I put down here micro cycle, cycles and mesocycles because this is the same idea of, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make these observations for the week. I'm going to go back and replan. I'm going to execute. And then, you know, or I'm going to plan the next one the next week I execute. So I'm doing that on a weekly cycle, but then I've also got to do that on a larger cycle, whatever that is. That could be a year. I'm going to show you one today that's a four month that I did. Um, and so uh, if you don't, if you don't do that, it becomes very difficult to kind of continue to connect the pieces for the players. So um, when you look at this, uh, this is really kind of what I'm, I'm, I'm saying to all of you. As you can see, um, the team tactical principles are really kind of the core of what you're doing, your style of play, your tactics, if you will. And then all the other qualities kind of fit around that. So the focus here is to read and understand the game. 
to solve the problems that the opponents may present to your players. And then we use all of these other elements uh, to do that. Um, Warren, I don't know if uh, you want to go ahead and unmute people or if there are any questions about this, because this is kind of a key concept before I get into um, style of play and and uh, other things. Patrick, for sure. Yeah, if you have a question right now, uh, I've got everybody on mute. All you have to do is uh, click on the microphone um, next to your, your face. And then does anybody have any questions at this point? we're good to go all right let's do it okay so with that being said um so why why would we use why would we use periodization um so keep in mind when i talk about periodization these could be what we call micro cycles they could be small small chunks it could be one week if you go and take a d course for us soccer they have a two-week um schedule that you you would submit um it could be months it could be a year if you're talking about um, player development in terms of periodization, it could be multiple years. Um, I can tell you that we actually have a periodization schedule at, um, at the high school I work at that is literally four years. <laughs> so, um, and then we have shorter periodization schedules depending on which team we're working with. So um, what, I would, what I would suggest is that um, you adopt one of these two ways to start and then if you want to develop both of them uh, you can go ahead and do this so the first idea and this is the one that i'm going to try to focus on today is this idea of player development so when we talk about and all of you can read that but how do we how do we want to ultimately develop our players in terms of um, the tactical problems that we want them to solve do we and then that becomes a little bit more complex issue because we're, what we're really talking about here is um, in terms of player development um, <clears throat> you know that could be individual players um, that could be what we call functional lines so for instance it could be your front three it could be your back four it could be your back three. Um, it could be your left side. So when we talk about uh, vertical seams, so it could be um, your left wing or your eleven. It could be um, your outside, your outside back, uh, your your three. It could be your central uh, vertical seams. So there could be a lot of things like that. And then ultimately, it could be it could be your team. Um, so, and then how do we connect all of those together? So when you really stop and think about it, this is how you end up in multiple year player development, because you're first going to get each of your individual positions, whatever they are, however you choose to play to understand their roles and responsibilities. Then if you follow the logic on this, you're going to get to, uh, you're going to have them understand how to act in functional groups to understand their roles and responsibilities within their functional groups. So, for instance, if you're playing with three in the midfield and you're six, eight, and ten, the eight may know individually what their roles and responsibilities are, but the six, eight, and ten may not know how to rotate and play together. And then you're talking about that. That's one thing, but if you play five in your midfield across, and how do they act with the seven and the 11 on the outside? So there's a lot, there's a lot to this. And so your periodization could be literally player development over the course of multiple years. I can tell you that many of the um, major league uh, soccer uh, clubs, including FC Dallas, um, where I worked in the girls academy for a very long time, um, but even the boys' side, uh, Sporting Kansas City, I've had an opportunity to go see what they do. Um, it is it is literally multi-year periodization schedules, and um, and this is all about player development. The other way we could periodize tactically is we could periodize for an opponent. This could take a couple of different uh, forms. It could be a situation in which you understand the the tactical trends or the, the problems that an opponent will present you. Um, maybe that's based on prior years of playing them. 
Maybe that's based on you went and you looked at how they played in a preseason tournament. And so you're going to take maybe uh, a week or you're going to take three to four days if it's in high school or maybe it's one day and you're going to do some sort of uh, preparation for that. So this typically is much more difficult in a high school setting. It's much easier in club settings where they play once a week. And so you could then prepare for an opponent that way. The other way that you could do it is you could set aside um, a period of time based on playing an opponent. If you're playing um, a home and home, you're going to play them at the first of the year. You put together a plan that you want to implement uh, over the course of a week or two, and then you're going to turn around and you're going to play them again because you've seen them. So that's another type of periodization. I think the best option um, at this point for this call and for what uh, all of us do is probably the player development uh, periodization. So that being said, where do we start? I mean, where do we really where do we really start when we talk about tactical tactical principles? Well, we start with the game with the game itself, and we talk about the structure the structure of the game. Um, and so, you know, obviously there's there's two goals. Um, there's uh, there's four phases of the game. We have the ball. We don't have the ball. We're in transition to get the ball. We're in transition of losing the ball. Um, we talk about the goal of the game. Obviously, the goal of the game is to score more goals than the opponent. And then we talk about maybe some general principles. The general principles I'm going to show all of you have to do with um, U.S. soccer. And so what we often refer to this, if you've taken a coaching course, is this idea that these are the things that really never change. They're always there. They're constantly there. And um, they don't um, they don't tend to change no matter who you are, no matter what style you play. At the end of the day, we all want to score more, more goals of the opponent. At the end of the day, we're going to have some general principles and we're going to have a structure of the game. So, uh, as I mentioned before, we're either attacking, we're either defending, which is um, kind of, you know, uh, obvious. What a lot of people don't consider is what do we do when we're in transition from attack to defense? And what do we do when we're in transition from defense to attack? Score more opponent, score more goals than your opponent. And then um, when we talk about some general principles, we often talk about some general principles as they apply to those four phases of the game. So how are we going to accomplish this goal of scoring more goals than the opponent? That's the problem that we have to solve. And that's why this becomes somewhat technical, okay? Or not somewhat, it does become technical. So I'm gonna leave this on the screen for just a second. I want, I've kind of taken some of this from U.S. soccer, um, and so I would suggest to you, unless you kind of have some different ideas to yourself, this might be a good way to start. Um, so when we have the ball, um, obviously, if we want to score score more goals than the opponent, we need to be able to score when we're attacking. So therefore, how how are we really going to do that? Well. I think the first thing is we need to find a way to uh, get the opponent um, disorganized. What does that mean? Does that mean that they're unable to move together to create, <clears throat> to leave big openings between themselves in which our team can get between them, in which the ball can go between them? Because in order for us to be able to score more goals in the opponent, we're going to have to be able to get the ball to their goal. And that could be from all the way from our end. It could be from their end, their half. Um, it could take a number of different, different things. But it would stand to reason that if they're very organized and there's not much space and they move together, that's going to be um, very difficult. So we need to be able to exploit or take advantage of the opponent when we have the ball in that fashion. 
Soccer is often a game of opposites. And so what do we want to do when we're defending? General principles, I would think all of us um, can agree that we want to get ourselves organized. We want to be balanced and we want to kind of stay that way. We don't want to allow big spaces between us, big spaces behind us. We don't want to end up in situations where um, we're constantly having our players um, being exploited 1v1 with no support, with no cover, with no balance. So this kind of goes kind of goes logically with the game of soccer. And then these are the parts that most coaches tend to for, tend to forget, and they're a little bit more difficult um, to teach. And if you go take grassroots or the new D course, we don't really spend much time about transition. If you go into um, the higher licenses, then this becomes the C's, your B's, your A's. This becomes more and more, uh, more and more prevalent. So when we transition, um, we need to we need to make sure that we're getting into some sort of defensive shape quickly, and we need to make sure that we're getting ourselves organized, balanced, and I'll even add, we need to then be able to stay that way. Likewise, um, when we win the ball, we've got to be able to get into the attack quickly, and we've got to be able to take advantage of an opponent who cannot get themselves organized and balanced and remain that way. These are all constants. They're general principles um, that I would ask you to think about um, before you embark on kind of a tactical periodization. And here's here's kind of here's kind of why. This right here becomes a very key graphic because if you look at the top, the things that we just talked about, the next box below it really becomes up to you. Let me let me reiterate that. The next box below really becomes up to you. Um, and I'm going to give you an example of that in a minute. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. Um, most most coaches, I do not think give um, enough time to the idea of a style of play and how they want to play. So again, this could go back to um, culture. And I mean, literally culture. It could go back to when you think about it, um, the idea that maybe you're from, you're originally from another country that they like to keep the ball. I mean, I go back to or a possession style of play, you know, the Spanish with the tiki taka type of play versus maybe an Iceland that plays, who wants to go direct to goal. Uh, it, you see it all the time, a Liverpool that Klopp is big on verticality and possession. We want to possess the ball, but we want to go as quickly to your goal as possible. Um, you, you see it any number of ways, and there's a lot of professional coaches and I'm sure all of you have done it. You could do all kinds of searches out there. There's many, many, many different ways um, in which to accomplish the goal of the game. There are many, many different ways to unbalance an opponent. There are many different ways to disorganize an opponent. There are many different ways to score more goals than the opponent. The question becomes for each of you, how do you want to do that? How, how do you see the game? Um, this is one of the greatest things about, about soccer, and I think it's one of the things that keeps people in it for life. It, it, it's never ending. Um, and I think you, you can look at that. Uh, you can look at that based on your past experiences. Another way that you can figure out a style of play is to observe other coaches. Um, other ways that you can do this, and this is kind of, um, a nice thing about high school soccer is a, that that's very different from club soccer is that uh, many assistants have to be assistants before they become head coaches. So there's somewhat of an apprenticeship program where you can see how a certain coach plays or how they want to do things. And then one of the things that I say when I instruct the coaching courses is the best the best coaches I've met, and I'm talking about people that. Uh, one of my friends is the um, was the uh, head coaching instructor for Oceana 
so Australia, New Zealand, and the, the man is constantly stealing ideas from everyone else. And so I would, I would suggest to you um, that the best coaches are positively the best thieves. So if you don't have a style of play and you don't have that written down somewhere, that would really be kind of the first order of business. Um, and then I would also suggest to you um, that uh, from your style of play, that you that you kind of think about some principles in each of the each of the four phases uh, that you want that you want to kind of live by. So if my style of play is to um, to be able to uh, score more goals than the opponent, and uh, I'm going to disorganize them, and I'm going to um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to exploit that disorganization and lack of balance. Then, and my and my style is to possess the ball. Then, perhaps one of my principles would be that I want to spread out immediately, and I want to. And a second one might be that I want to change the point of attack. That that may be two principles for me in my style of play because I want to possess the ball in order to accomplish that goal. But if I'm if I'm a coach that says no, I want to um, do, I want to attack the opponent as quickly as possible. That's my style of play. I want to I, I don't care about possession. I want to immediately attack them as soon as possible because my idea is that scoring goals is to get behind them as fast as I possibly can. Then. That wouldn't my principle wouldn't be to spread out. My principle would be to immediately play forward, what they call verticality and possession. That's my immediate, that's how I wish to play. And so there's nothing wrong with any of these things that I've suggested. You, we may not philosophically agree that that's the best way to play soccer, but there's nothing wrong. I would suggest all of you, and this is my personal opinion. The only thing that might be wrong is not thinking through this process. Because then what you're ultimately trying to do is you're trying to you're trying to teach your team to play in a way that's that's inherent to you, but may not be logically connected to them. The last thing I would suggest is if you've developed this style of play and team principles, you really need to think about what types of qualities in your players that you're wanting to develop to execute your style of play according to the principles that you have set down. When we typically go out to look at players and scout players for U.S. soccer or do player evaluations is probably a better way to put that. When we often do that, we do that according to the style of play, the team principles, and the player qualities that U.S. soccer has identified to play how U.S. soccer wants to play. So if you kind of follow the idea there, it would be very difficult to evaluate players if you don't evaluate them relative to your style of play and the principles you want to play under. So for instance, in, in US soccer's style of play, they want to have a possession style of play where they build out of the back third through this middle third into the, into the, the attacking third. If that's the case, then we need for those players um, because that's, we need for all of those players to be able to technically execute passing, preferably with both feet, and receiving the ball, preferably with both feet and the rest of their body, at an optimal technical level for 90 minutes, because that's what an international match is. So that becomes a consideration. If the U.S. soccer decided that we were going to play direct in a 4-4-2, and we weren't going to hold on to the ball in the back or build through the thirds, then the tactic, the technical considerations become much different. Is that wrong? Is it right? 
I leave that for all of you to decide. Maybe the results um, would indicate that. But as far as evaluation of the players, that's the criteria that we evaluate the players on. So I, if it, hopefully for all of you, as you're listening to what I'm saying, I'm not, in, I'm not suggesting at all you do anything a certain way. I'm suggesting that you have a way. So if you follow the boxes down, now that we've kind of established our style of play and our team principles, and we're thinking about what our players need to do to execute our style of play, now you get to the idea of formation, strategies and systems of play and i probably jumbled this around a little bit so i'm not going to talk about it in that exact order um, but but let me let me talk first about a formation um, a lot there's a lot of different opinions on formations per se but for the most part when we talk about a formation we're actually talking about kind of how we start the game it's really our lineup before we start the game so if you play, you know, one, four, three, three, so a four, three, three formation, why do you play it that way? And does it style it does it go back to your style of play? So for instance, um, US soccer and its youth national teams, they play in a four, three, three. That was not a random choice. The formation, because they want to play a possession style of play, requires that we be able to create triangles and diamonds or diagonal passing lines uh, all over the field in all thirds. Well, if, if we need to do that, the formation, if you actually sit down and draw out a 4-3-3 is connected by triangles and diamonds all over the field. This is just, this is the same idea. <clears throat> you could also look at this and I'll use a collegiate example. If you look at the University of North Carolina women's team that play 3-4-3. Three, three. Anson Durant has written books about this. It's widely known. Um, I've had players that I've worked with that, that play there, have played there. I know people that have played there. They play that way because it fits their style of play to press you with three forwards, take away your width, press you in your own third, and turn over the ball as close to your goal as, as your own goal as possible so they can score as many goals as possible. So that that is how they solve the goal of the game to score more goals than you the formation is kind of an extension of the style of play but in reality it's it's how we start the game it's an overall concept the next thing i would suggest to you and this is something that i've discovered a lot of coaches kind of miss is the idea of an actual system of play so when we talk about a system of play what shape do we really want to be in when we're in a phase of play? So my formation may be one, four, three, three, but my system of play when I'm attacking may be one, two, three. I'm gonna get this right. One, yeah, excuse me, one, two, three two, three, I think I have that right. So that may be how I play. My, my formation may be one, four, three, three, but when we don't have the ball, I may want to play one, four, one, four, one. That may be, that may be how I choose to play. There are any number of configurations of that. But most coaches don't think about their system of play and how they're going to um, be able to integrate their team principles, their style of play, and ultimately um, accomplish the goal of the game in those phases. So hopefully what you're starting to see is that we've started with these big general concepts. And now what I'm doing is I'm taking you through literally breaking it down step by step. Once you have your systems of play, you ought to think about your specific strategies that you want to use within your systems of play. So my formation may be one, four, three, three, but when I'm defending, I may play one, four, 
one for one and my strategy is i want to play that because i want to trap the opponent i want to trap the opponent in the flank that's my strategy and that's tied to my style of play because if i can trap you in the attacking third and my style of play is to win the ball as close to your goal as possible and then i've looked at the idea of we're going to my team my team principal defending is that we are going to pressure you in a direction now that all starts to fit together i want to win the ball as close to your goal as possible uh my my player qualities are to teach all my players to take you in a direction so directional pressure um i'm going to then uh teach those principles i'm going to look for players that are physically quick that are explosive my training is going to re revolve around um a lot of stuff that involves acceleration deceleration it's going to revolve around games that require directional pressure and that's all going to help me execute my style of play and then my strategy is going to be teaching my team how to trap you as the opponent and that solves and that solves a problem so they have to be able to read and understand the game to do those things and and i've kind of alluded to it if you go down to the bottom bottom uh the bottom box if you will now you get into the actual tactics so if i'm going to use a strategy of trapping you out of my one four one four one system of play now I'm dealing with the individual tactics. What does my nine do in terms of directional pressure with my system of, with my principles of play? Is that guy, does that guy have the, the right qualities to do that in my players to, in order to do this? And then once I get him to where he knows what he's doing, do I have my seven and my 11 know what they're doing? Do my eight and 10 know what they're doing? And then I'm gonna go from there and I'm gonna talk about do do my do my four behind my nine know what they're doing can my six play in relation to my eight ten seven eleven and then ultimately can i get the lines to play together what i just did was i basically just just get did a periodization <laughs> i divided everything up so let me reiterate that this that's one that's one way of doing things it's not the only way you could choose to defend four two three one you could you could choose to play you could choose to have a formation of a four three three but you're going to use a system of a system of play of three five two defending and four four two attacking it's infinite it's infinite and so <clears throat> i would suggest when we talk about player development that maybe you start with one formation and then two systems of play in your attack and defense and then think about your transition when you get to a professional level or an international level then you get into um all sorts of various systems and things like that there was an analysis done and i can't remember the exact um the exact uh numbers on this but it was it was um something i heard through u.s soccer that they did an analysis on croatia in the last world cup and they had played within one game something like 11 different systems of play so if you have players that sophisticated you can only imagine how difficult it becomes to play against a team like that when you you have no idea of what system of play they may throw at you in any of the four phases very difficult to read and understand the game if you're their opponent but this also requires very high level players all right, Warren. So I've I've rambled on. Hopefully this was helpful to people. I, I don't know, but if there are any questions, I will try to answer them. All right. If you just unmute yourself at any point in time, if you have a question for Brian, I thank you very much. That was, that was unbelievably interesting. I sure appreciate it. Does anybody have questions at this point?
I'll jump in. Uh, Sam here from Marcus High School. Um, hey, hey you know, Sam, like, how are you, buddy? I'm good. How are you? Good, good. Nice to see you. Yeah, you too. I appreciate the presentation, man. It's been awesome. Um, like for me, for me, I'm in the middle of creating my periodization plan, and you know, for the most part, I, like I've got my macro cycle already set up, but mm -hmm. you know, I think. I think, you know, like you said, I think everybody's is going to be different from or just because of like the players that they have. Like for me, you know, uh, compared to somebody like Ben, who's at South Grand Prairie, who may not have as many club players. But like for me, I know that like my plan is going to be based around those kids also playing club as well. So like the mm -hmm. things that I may want to do may not necessarily fit within the physical compounds of our team because i'm not going to like run kid into the ground it's like they've got a tournament that weekend so for me i feel like like it's more important to establish a physical a physical load of a periodization plan and then base my tactical concepts off of that you know more so than maybe focusing on tactical concepts and then you know inquiring like a physical load if that makes sense so like what do you think do you, yeah, like, yeah. For me, i feel like i'd rather make a physical periodization plan before i make it and then go off the tactical one off of that if that makes sense uh yeah it does and 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 that's not again i don't know that there's necessarily a wrong or a right to this um i'm in the same boat that you are um, what I might say and what might make sense is once we kind of get to the end and I show you an example of of one that I did, I think you can I think you can still without going into detail and knowing exactly what you're thinking of and how you want to play. Um, but I think you could still integrate your physical um, your physical periodization around uh, tactically what you want to execute. Um, uh, and so you, but that will be up to you as to whether you, you think you can do that or not. I, I also have a lot of club players and I can tell you that we use a tactical periodization, but I adjust the load, um, based on, um, based on what they're doing or based on how they're, uh, I'm in, I mean, I'm in probably the same as you. I'm in contact with their club coaches or what have you, and I know what their load is. Um, so I would say you could do a lot of that with how you structure the training session. And, and this is kind of a much bigger topic for another day. This gets into the idea of core exercises or core training activities that still emphasize your principles of play. So in other words, I could still teach the same principles inside my style of play and reduce the physical load by increasing the numbers and reducing the duration, but I could still teach them, teach them to solve the same problems. I can also up the physical load by playing smaller numbers in longer duration with shorter rest intervals. And I don't really want to go down this rabbit hole in this because that gets into it. But but you could do that if that makes sense to you. Right. Just a thought. Yeah, cool. All right. Sure. You bet. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right. Hey Warren, are you gonna make this available online? Yeah, yeah the same thing we did last time. Yeah, for sure. Good deal. That's my question. <laughs> All right. It sounds good. Thanks, Fred. All right. So if there are no more questions, um, let me kind of move on and, and uh, kind of give you an example. Um, uh, but first, I want you all to kind of think about this. Um, really, again, I go back to this idea that it's a course of study in your, in your soccer classroom. Um, you can build your course uh, or your your style of play or what you wish to do in any sequence but really what it needs to do is it me needs to make sense in regards to your style of play um, your principles and your key ca characteristics of your players to execute your your style of play um, there's there's a philosophical debate here in terms of 
do I build my style of play around the players that I have, or do I go ahead and develop my players um, through, uh, do I develop my players um, to play my style that I want to play? That's really philosophical. I don't know that there's a right or a wrong answer. And I would think that would depend on your situation and ultimately it would depend on your philosophy. And so I don't really personally see a problem either way. That's up to you. That's your choice. Um, but what I would say is, um, and, and I see this a lot in the coaching courses, um, that you've got, you've got to build something. There needs to be a plan. Um, I, I've seen an awful lot of club coaches, and if you're a club coach, you're going to know what I'm talking about, that basically walk out to the field every night and they go, okay, well, what are we going to do? What are we doing today? What's the plan today? And so there's really, it becomes very difficult to connect A to B to C to D for the players if you don't actually sit down and have a plan. And this is probably the biggest, biggest um mistake that I see in a lot of coaches that we work with is the fact that they just don't have a plan. They may know soccer. They may, um, they may have been a pro. They may have been all these things and in their mind, they know what they want, but it becomes a lot different thing to know what you want and then to turn around and teach what you want. So I would say, um, you know, if nothing else, develop a plan, no matter what it is, U S soccer, um, tends to, create its micro cycles. Uh, if you take a D course, it'll be two weeks. Um, and then those ultimately build into meso cycles. Uh, the A license, I believe now is a, it is a four, <clears throat> a four month plan um, divided by a week. Uh, so think of this as your textbook and your micro cycles are the individual chapters within your textbook or your course. And the chapters need to connect to tell the overall story of your text. So let me repeat that again. The chapters of your of your book, of your course, of your soccer that you're teaching your players need to connect to your overall textbook. It, there needs to be a big picture to it. So if you're doing kind of random training sessions ad hoc, that ultimately becomes um, difficult. In theory, if you have phenomenal players and your players are are really good and they're superior to the other players, most likely you will win. But if you're in a situation, particularly, let's say, the international level where all all the players are very good, um, they're you know, they're all good coaches, et cetera, et cetera. If the players don't have an overall understanding of how they are going to play, then it becomes extremely extremely difficult to be successful um, against opponents who are very well organized in this respect and the players understand their roles and responsibilities across multiple levels. And I can tell you that for a fact, both as a player and, you know, talking with our youth national team coaches um, about some of the results and various things. Um, this is really a key idea that they be able, they be able to solve problems. The only way you're going to do that is being taught to solve problems. All right, so um, let me go ahead and move on. So here was an example. I just very briefly built a one uh, a one week micro cycle. This is something that you might use in a club situation. I understand that this may not necessarily um, be in a high school situation, but it might be in an in a in an off season high school situation. So here's an example. Um, my style of play is to win the ball as close to the opponent's goal as possible. Um, score, uh, you know, score through transitions behind the opponent's back line while in transition from defense to attack. So you can read my overall idea with the style. In the first session, what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on pressing the opponent and attacking third, um, trapping them out of a one for one system and the team's building out in this in such and such system. So why would you do this this way? Well, my overall style is to win the opponent's goal as close as possible. And this is where the tactical emphasis comes in. My suggestion to all of you is that, um, that 
we're teaching the players to tactically solve problems, to read and understand the game. And so that the more problems that they encounter and the more problems they learn to solve, the better they'll become at problem solving on the field. So that being said, if you'll notice, um, we worked on pressing out of this system against a different system. And then we work on pressing the opponent and, the attack and attacking third to create turnovers using a three forward front. And so we're going to press them differently this time. We're going to press them with a four, one, two, three. And then the opponent is going to build out differently. And so this in and of itself um, could, could involve numerous training sessions built off of this. But at the end of the day, what we want the what we want our teams to do and our players to do is recognize all of the tactical cues and be able to read those on the field. And if we're able to do this, then what this also does is create a lot more opponents or a lot more problems for our opponent. So now they don't necessarily know what we're going to play or how we're going to play or how we're going to trap them. At the end, I've put in an 11 v 11 game, because if you'll remember from the first of the presentation, we've basically said that we're going to um, that we're going to always evaluate. So at the end of this micro cycle, I'm going to evaluate whether we can actually do that or not. And if we can't, I may need to go back and do this again. I may need to do it in a different way. And, and I would suggest again that with a lot of coaches, this evaluation cycle, this continuous improvement cycle is something we know we should do, but in a lot of cases, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. I would also suggest to many of you um, that, that nowadays, the use of video analysis to film trainings this goes on at the pro level now extensively, and that um, that would be a situation to look at both your individual players, your lines, and your entire team to see if they're doing these things. And if they're not, you may have to revisit that. So there's one example. My suggestion to all of you is to build your micro cycles first and then combine them in a such a way to create a course of study. So write your chapters first of how you want to play once you've thought through all of this, and then, and then put your book together. For those of you who are soccer junkies, this is really kind of a fascinating uh, thing to do. It's also a fascinating thing to look at how other people have done this and break down what they did. So me personally, I spend a lot of time. Um, I spend a lot of time combing through tactical, tactical books and different things that guys have written on uh, various styles of play and tactical implementation of those. Another exercise that um, is interesting to do is pick a game, a team you like, turn off the sound so you can't hear the announcers, and see if you can figure out for those ten minutes what's their style of play, what. What, what systems of play are they playing in all the phases? So not only do we learn to put in our own plan and, des and design a tactical periodization plan, we learn to evaluate that by doing those things. Because it's not, it's not necessarily easy to watch a game and pick out individual players in your system of play, look at your various lines in your system of play, and then look at the entire team. That becomes somewhat of a complicated exercise, and then can you do it within a shortened period of time? I think if you if you develop and put your own periodization plan together, coaches I've worked with who have done this have said that ultimately it helps them be able to read and understand the game better. But that's just a suggestion uh, for everyone. All right. So um, that that's kind of the end of the presentation. Hopefully I'm not running too far over. Um, I wanted to show you guys this. This was done. Um, this was done in a club level. This was done in 2018 um, for a team I was was working with. And um, you can see uh, that 
<clears throat> what we have here is um, uh, basically a plan with uh, a daily schedule. Now, this was actually a team in the Development Academy. And what we did was we looked at the team functions. So we worked on attacking. Um, we broke it down further by areas of the field. Um, we looked at the team goals and tactical uh, things that we wanted to do. And then, Sam, this may answer your question. This was actually the preseason. So we designed everything around um, a certain uh, periodization, uh, physical periodization. And then we went in and we looked at the numbers and the durations and then the actual activities for the training session. So, um, so this was designed for an, a development academy team. You can do this and I do this for the high school team as well. Um, so this is, uh, this is a, a, a four month plan. And so what we initially did was we looked at, um, this was the preseason that went uh, through, as you can see, a team function. Uh, and then we looked at what thirds of the field we wanted to work on. So we trained the players there. We had specific goals and team tactical things that we wanted to do based on our style of play. And Sam, here's this here again is the where we worked on the physical demand. So we designed the session to incorporate because it was preseason a certain uh, a certain um, physical demand. You could change this around quite a bit. Um, and then we went ahead and we developed the session under underneath that. Um, that's week one of preseason. And so what ends up happening is if you start to follow week one we worked on attacking and we basically worked uh, on building the ball up through the third so we started defensive middle defensive middle defensive we were working on getting into the opponent's half and then we turned around and said well what happens if we you know we want to look at pressing so now we we looked at pressing on the other end and so what eventually happens in this plan is that we start to tie all of this together so that the players understood, um, okay, we're gonna build up. And then if we lose the ball, if we lose the ball, then what do we do when we lose the ball through building up? And then we looked at, okay, well, if we're gonna press, uh, we press, we win the ball, what are we gonna do? If we press and they break our press, how are we gonna drop back and then defend? So it has to be logically connected. You you could do it that way you could do it other ways um, so and as you notice um, we start to adjust uh, the physical demand but we're still teaching um, a lot of the same principles so i've got uh, where we're teaching getting compact and staying compact this was at a 90 percent capacity but this is we're just working on the organizational aspect so if you knew that your club players had played on Sunday, maybe we maybe we have a recovery session where we do a walkthrough of how we're going to get organized. And then maybe because they have two weeks off, maybe we go 90% capacity and we do a whole lot of 1v1 and 2v2 defending, which is still tactical. In 2v2, you still have to stay together to get compact. There, that, in fact, that's pretty fundamental. It's not just about staying together 3v3, 4v4, or 10v10. So you could adjust these various things um, to do that. So, and that's what we did. And so basically we went through week to week to week, and then all of this kind of built onto itself. And we went from, kind of went through here. So if you go and you take some of the licensing through the Federation, um, these are some of the resources that they, they will ultimately give you. Um, and generally, we start with just the two week plan. But once you get to a certain point, you know, week 10 on and on and on it goes. So hopefully you, you guys can kind of see that this wasn't intended to be in, in great detail, but to give you guys kind of an overall, uh, an overall idea. Warren, that's about it for me. I hope people find this helpful. Questions for anyone?
Hey, I sure appreciate it, Brian. That was unbelievably interesting. That was, that was well worth it, every bit of it. Hey, a couple of things right quick. Does anybody have any questions for Brian? And thank you very much for today. I'll kind of go over some of the things that we've got. If you'll go right now into the chat, uh, I've got the resources page that, that we built for the last six weeks. If you're not on that list, go ahead and uh, sign up for that. That'll, that link will get you in and get you all the resources you need. And also, I've got, I'm about to put in the sign up sheet. So, on this, this is our um, webinar spreadsheet, which has all the contact information. If you want to be added to the weekly invite, if you'll just put your stuff in there, and I'll, I'll put that up right now. If you haven't already signed up and you want to be included in all the, the webinar stuff, you put it there on the side. Last thing we're going to do is put up uh, for next week. We've got uh, Janae out of uh, South Texas, the uh, technical director, and then Gary Williamson with North Texas as well. And they're going to kind of take and expand on kind of what Brian's brought up today with the licensing in U.S. soccer. So I think today and the last two weeks has kind of really done a good job of building up to this next round. Following that week, uh, we now have Joy Rodriguez who's going to step in. He'll be doing the two weeks from now and then followed by Bruce Reichman. And then hopefully we'll get Brian back in for a uh, player evaluation. If there's something that you want to know or you feel, feel like you want to present, then please reach out to me. You know, we'll get you on and get you a time. But I appreciate the time that, that we take each and every time. But like I said, for next week, if you'll do me a favor, they've asked for just information to help gear the webinar for next week. And if you'll fill out the school content, it won't take more than like five minutes. I'm putting that, that's the link right there, the Google Forms, and just take that quick survey and that'll help drive uh, next week's webinar in the morning. Does anybody have any questions for me or for, for Fred or anything else or, or Joey that, that might want to know something? All right, with that being said, I'll stay on for a little bit longer so you guys can get with the, um, or fill out those forms, keep those links up, or just want to sit around and chat. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just, just so, just so all of you guys know too, um, part of, part of the thing with myself or Janae or Gary or any of us who do, um, coaching instruction, uh, you know, part of what we sign up for is also a mentoring process. Warren will tell you, tell you that. So if anybody, um, chooses or has questions or, or wants to, uh, contact me directly. Um, I'll let Warren go ahead and include or send out my email or contact information. Um, you know, you're more than welcome to contact me. If I'm not available, I will, I will be more than happy to call you back. Don't worry about it. People, people have taken courses with me, do it all the time. And I'm more than, more than happy to help. So, um, just, just, just so you know. That goes for me as well. You know, if you need, you need a mentor, I can do that as well. But. This is awesome. Like I said, and it's an unbelievable good group of people here. 38 guys, we are up to 41 at one point. Each week we continue, continue to grow. And so I think that that says a lot for, for our presenters and the quality, such as Brian. And then you guys as well, trying to get better and, and trying to improve your craft. Um, like I said, any questions or anything in the future, just let me know and, and we're here for you. And I'll have this up online as quickly as I can get it. All right. That being said, thank you very much. And and hey, like I said, enjoy seeing you guys. We'll see you next week. Um, we'll hang around here for a few more minutes if you got any more questions or anything else. But thank you all very much.